we, we it, talked for a while about, should we brand ourselves as a procurement accelerator? Right. Um, but it's like, God, no, don't, don't talk about that. Right. You know, and Tom, you talk about the wild West. I mean, we, we have members with cooling towers. <laughs> I'm done with that. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Like cooling I, towers I, are not I, a priority for any business, but they all <laughs> use them. So hello and welcome to the stream, an unscripted, unedited, free-flowing conversation featuring guests who reject the status quo with a bias for action in the world of water and beyond. My name is Tom Freyberg. I'm an environmental journalist and content creator specializing in water. And I'm Will Sarney, a water strategy advisor doing my part to solve wicked water problems. And today we are thrilled to be joined by Nate Allen, who is the executive director for Waterstar. Nate, how are you? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Great to be here this morning. Great to have you. Yeah, we're looking forward to a, uh, a very lively discussion with you. So uh, <laughs> thanks for thanks for agreeing to do this. Um, we know you have got a rush off to a uh, highly important donuts with dad. Um, That's right. At, at the school, right. so we cannot interrupt that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> now we want to talk about various things, but maybe just give us a kind of for people who may not know Water Start yourself, really just elevate a pitch. What do you guys do? What you're about? Just to kind of get started. Yeah, awesome. So, uh, Water Start's a non for profit. Our mission is to be a channel to accelerate the adoption and deployment of water technologies. Um, we're a membership organization, and uh, our members deliver water to about, I don't know, 33 million people or so in the UK. Western United States, Australia, um, a big, big part of our focus is using our non-for-profit status to raise grant funds to co-fund the deployment um, of new technologies that solve really specific priorities that uh, our members give us. So um, we've been around since really kind of 2015 or so, started out as a state of Nevada um, hub initiative and have have grown from there to where we've now deployed 42 different technologies about 40 percent of those have turned into long-term solutions so um yeah that that's our that's our mission hey, Nate could you talk a little bit about impact I seem to recall you had quantified uh the impact of your uh technology portfolio and what your member organizations have done in terms of, you know, deploying capital uh, and addressing water issues. I, I don't recall the metrics, but I'm hopeful that you do. Sure. I mean, broadly, we deploy technologies that we kind of categorize as either making more safer or cheaper water. Um, so, you know, tech companies, solutions that relate to uh, like leak detection and extending the resource. We do a lot of stuff related to conservation. Um, safer, we do a lot of things related to IoT monitoring um, as well as then um, cheaper. You know, basically anything we're deploying is really looking at making our members able to be more resilient. And we've now spent I don't know, three and a half million on pilot projects. And we estimate that the, those pilots have solved quite a bit more. I mean, it's, it's a pretty conservative estimate right now is that it's quite a bit more than like $30 million. So we've got okay. at, least, at least a 10X um, back to our members mm -hmm. from a financial standpoint. It, yeah, that, that's where I was going with this in terms mm -hmm. of... Um, you know, what the invested capital has returned, uh, you know, from a uh, quantitative perspective, uh, in addition to a, a financial return, yeah. uh, even though you're not a fund. Um, right. And one of the things we were riffing on before we went live, assuming that this is live, was uh, ESG and uh, the role of technology companies now, in particular digital technologies, 
yeah. uh, plugging into the really dire need to quantify impact uh, you know, on the environmental and the social side for either utilities or industrial clients to roll up for internal and external reporting. And, and you know, it's a thing. I mean, we can yeah, for sure. you know, lo lose our minds about ESG reporting and yeah. what it really means and so on. But from a technology perspective, it really does seem to be something that's uh, getting a lot of attention and a lot of investment. It, it does. And I think it's about time you know, um, <laughs> right. Like I well, think it's, <laughs> I think it's amazing. You know um, I, I mean, I think you guys had Ian Olson from McDonald's on one yeah. of the podcasts, maybe last season. Um, you know, we're really fortunate to have Ian on our board. And I remember getting to know him and he was like, Oh, in 2001, I started running things for Ford motor company, you know, running their sustainability program. And I was like, 2001 I was like at university being like I want a degree in sustainability and they were like that's not a thing you know <laughs> so like it's a it's about that's... time right you know it's about time that that ESG is really taking off um yeah you know but but it is kind of challenging right to figure out how to get these like national or international standards and point systems yeah. to align with like you know water impacts that are hyper local right in in how you manage and respond to them right yeah i th i think not to dominate the conversation run off into the esg rabbit hole but what the yeah, heck yeah. um it, it it's interesting i mean it, water is underrepresented in the e and the s part yeah. you know, like grossly underrepresented and yeah. uh, climate change, that thing called climate change and all that yeah. is um, dominant. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I see a couple of challenges, you know, I, I, my view is that ESG is a reporting strategy, not a sustainability or a resilience strategy. I think it's a great but, way to put it, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I, and it's, you know, I, I think where we've landed is that it's kind of the tail wagging the dog as opposed to, I want to make an investment in sustainability, environmental and social performance, because it drives social impact, business value, um, brand value. And then I can quantify performance and report it through an ESG framework, as opposed yeah. to I have an ESG strategy. And what can I say? You know, it, so. I think it's a great, it, great way to put it. Sorry, Tom, go ahead. I was just um, going to say um, it needs to go beyond the kind of the headline and the greenwashing, yeah. right? And arguably at the moment, the reporting side of it is a wild west of there's still a lot of, <laughs> to, to put it politely, yeah. a lot of uncertainty and perhaps confusion on this. Um, it's more than a bandwagon, right? But I think um, just from what you're saying earlier, Nate, would you say part of the value that you can drive then for your members under this ESG movement is your connecting solutions to a very specific problem that exists would you say just from kind of ascertaining like you're not just trying to connect people for the sake of we hope you guys make it work you're potentially looking among the public and the private sector but now having mcdonald's on board finding where there's a need for a solution and then you're scouting the market and finding that solution for me that's i think as a not-for-profit as well one of the, the biggest values that you can bring yeah, thanks, Tom. I, I think that is exactly right. Just, I mean, one very relevant topic that we're starting to, well, that we're picking up steam on. Um, you know, we've had commercial members for a long time, you know, large consumers. And a number of those commercial members, you know, understand a big part of their water consumption is evaporative cooling towers, um, which makes a lot of sense in terms of ESG reporting, right? because you are going to defer um, energy consumption, which is carbon intensive, um, you know, by running mechanical chillers, you know, that are as, you know, take up the first floor of the resort, right? Um, you know, you're deferring that to pretty cheap water, right? And evaporating it. So you use an evaporative cooling tower to like take the first 10 degrees off of ambient or in Las Vegas, 
the first 20, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but when you look at, you know, from a water standpoint, you know, evaporative cooling towers in most cities, in particular in the Southwest US, you know, it's second to turf in consumptive water use, right? right? It's really serious. So there's this, you know, initial kind of conflict when you first look at what are you going to do, like in cities like Las Vegas, who put a moratorium on new evaporative cooling towers, right? Um, You know, you have these global companies who have built their supply chain and their, you know, designs around their facilities around a low carbon criteria, but then you come locally, right? And it has a huge impact on water supply or water quality, right? It's, Mm -hmm. it's a challenge that we get brought into the room on to figure out, well, are there ways we can make cooling towers more efficient? Are there alternative low cost, low carbon cooling technologies that can replace cooling towers? So we've worked on cooling tower efficiency for, a you know, I don't know, five years, probably. I think we've done six different pilots in the past on different things. You know, and Tom, you talk about the Wild West. I mean, we we have members with cooling towers made out of plywood. Like, like cooling towers are not a priority for any business, but they all use them. They all use them, right? Um, and so it's it is really like uncharted territory to figure out how do we address this these kind of conflicts between national international ESG reporting and hyper localized water supply issues, right? And, and, and also that, you know, if you're laser focused on, you know, net zero carbon, that really collides with the reality of, well, cooling towers in the American West or any other arid part of the world. So, you know, having more of a systemic approach to the intersection of, of water and, and energy is, is really essential at this point. I, yeah. I, I think it's pretty amazing what Las Vegas is doing in terms of just really drawing a line saying, look, you know, it no longer works. It's no longer acceptable. And that will drive innovation and solutions that really can address both yeah. uh, carbon emissions and water availability. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think I think just like, you know, when Las Vegas 20 years ago said they'd start paying people to pull their turf out. You know, that's a practice that's all over the West now, right? Right. Um, so I think this this um, is, is probably like conservation 2.0, <laughs> right? When it comes to, right. you know, municipalities incentivizing and putting restrictions in on how water is used um, by new development in their different communities, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty interesting again, not to spend all of our time on ESG, but the other component (laughs) that I think is really missing um, that I don't know how anybody is really factoring is, you know, I talked about cheaper water, right? You know, we, we, we look at more safer, cheaper, you know what I mean? And that's kind of like, I I, I was going to bring that up with you as (laughs) sort of a, a sticky point, mate. So You go first. Yeah, because <laughs> look, I, I know that kind of the common narrative in like the water innovation and the sustainability environmental community is like water is too cheap. Um, that's why people waste it, X, Y, and Z. And so to say, you know, we we look at solutions to make water cheaper, I mean it to be a bit, um, what's the word I'm looking for? provocative thank you provocative that's (laughs) i mean it to be that way and you know the last year of covid inflation aside the 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 trend for the last 20 years has been that the cost of water has outpaced inflation and wage growth by more than double digits sure right and and that's a real risk to people who you know, are, are, um, you know, underserved, um, Mm -hmm. unsupported, you know, historically marginalized communities. 
And that's a, supposed to be a part of ESG, but where is the accounting it, for that? It, it, so how, Nate- it, How do you account it, for it, utility bills, right? Anyway. So, so food for thought, um, yeah. uh, not suggesting you rebrand, but uh, <laughs> give it some thought here that, yeah. I mean, what you're really talking about is equitable access to water. And, you know, that includes ensuring that the price is set for people that um, are not in the higher economic tier, uh, but also, you know, plumbing, off-grid solutions, decentralized solutions. So, yeah, it, good but, to be provocative, but, Nate. I don't want to tone you down, but... Uh, <laughs> Look, it's it's serious, you know, and there's a lot of conversation about like, you know, access to clean drinking water in developing countries. There's a lot of conversations about, you know, like the lead issue in, you know, not just Flint, but that gets a lot of a, a lot of headlines. I mean, you know, that's just fraud, right? There's nothing about like infrastructure management. Um, when it comes to lead pipes and how that was managed in Flint, that's fraud. So there is this, there is this gap in the discussion about affordable water that right. is this huge middle between like, how do we address fraud, right? And then how do we just build new infrastructure for people? There is this huge, huge population, very close to where most of us live, right? That we, we have to figure out how are we going to maintain affordable drinking water in, you know, to marginalized communities where there's already existing infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's a challenge and it's something that we certainly look at and talk with our members about as we choose what kind of innovation priorities they're after, right? Well, I think people often talk about SDG six, right, in terms of access to clean drinking water and sanitation for all. And yeah. people tend to think of the hundreds of millions in developing nations that don't currently have access, but actually, especially in where you guys are in North America, there's tens of millions that don't have access to clean water as well because of yeah. uh, aging infrastructure, because of, you've mentioned about lead contamination as well. And that that's, you know, there's an increased consumption of bottled water as well. So it goes way beyond developing nations. I mean, I don't want to talk yeah. about the UK and, 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 and European developed nations, but I think that often doesn't get brought into the conversation, I think. It, Absolutely. It, and the number that's, it's interesting you bring this up, Tom, that, you know, the number that I've seen is, you know, there's roughly 3 million people in the US that have access to safe drinking water. That number can't be, Right, I, you know, it's gotta be 10X, I would bet. Um, I, you know, the, one of the statistics is that there's roughly about 60 million people in the US that don't trust their tap water. I mean, that's mind blowing. Right. You know, you in know, the scheme of things. So it's much more complex, much more, It is. I would say nuanced in terms yeah, yeah. of, you know, what are the issues that you could bundle together and say, you know, yeah, people don't have access and they, they don't make a choice. And then, you know, environmental justice, which has always been a thing for decades, uh, yeah. decades and decades, uh, you know, going back to things like Love Canal, you know, Wilbur, Massachusetts, those were environmental justice issues. Yeah. And this is unfortunately, tragically, sort of the next phase. That That's right. That's right. And you know, that's not to leave out all those other great causes, right? But there does seem, for, from my standpoint, there's kind of a gap that mm -hmm. people are not considering, right? You know, and it, and it really connects with like, you know, general economic development planning in cities. You know, there needs to be a lot more cities that are looking at this kind of ratio of like dollar per gallon per job. Um, in determining whether they want mm. to incentivize a company to come and set up in their communities, right? Because, you know, if you bring a bottling company into a, a community that is supply stressed, you know, you're basically like incentivizing a company to export water from a community that 
you know, that may compromise the folks on the lowest end of the socioeconomic spectrum, right? Um, whereas, you know, prioritizing some other industry that would create higher paying jobs, well, maybe, maybe that is worth it. You know what I mean? So right. um, there, there's, there's some parts of the ESG sustainability um, structure right now that it'd be, would be nice if it actually like, what's the, where, where am I trying to go? Like it actually would kind of inform these corporations that want to report that like, Hey, if you're, if you're planning for growth, you need to consider these factors in where you want to grow to. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, I, you know, you, you, this is a, another interesting point and you didn't even give me the chance to sort of give you the word that you were looking for. I thought we were going to be on a roll here, but um, <laughs> sorry, Will. <laughs> it, it, no, when I was at that management consulting firm mm -hmm. um, before Water Foundry, they had a really well-developed and, and thriving site location business where they were working with companies on helping them think about where do you move to? Where do you grow uh -huh. to? Yeah. And when I started the water strategy practice there, we embedded water as a factor into their site location business. And it was really, really interesting to yeah. add another dimension to it. It wasn't dominant, but, yeah. you know, just acknowledging, <clears throat> excuse me, that it was another factor to consider to your point. Yeah. Yeah. You, you only have to look at the um, the recent news about a certain um, electric car company and uh, <laughs> the gigafactory in Germany potentially being affected by water and right. uh, the, the certain CEO of said electric car company perhaps having to eat his words over the impact of water on the long-term operation of the business. Um, we're, we've, we've had conversations about this and obviously I, I, where, where I, you are as you well, know, Nate. Tom, the, the it's... Tom, it's such a great example of kind of what we're talking about, right? I mean, here, you know, said company also has, you know, an equivalent manufacturing plant, I don't know, 40 minutes from where I'm sitting right now, right? right? That gets, I think we get like six inches of annual rainfall compared to Germany that gets 40, mm -hmm. right? So it's no wonder that you know, you laugh that off and say, come on, we're doing it in Nevada. Why shouldn't we be able to do it in Germany? But, you know, that's, that is the nature of infrastructure, right? Infrastructure is designed based on a historical expectation, right? And any time that water availability goes outside of what you've planned for, there are problems. Right. Well, it, it, you know, this said company issue is really interesting because, you know, my view is that, yeah, you can build a semiconductor factory in the desert. You can build a car factory in the desert, just not using best practices now. I mean, you, you, you really have to invest in water efficiency, water reuse, uh, have cooperative uh, programs with yeah. uh, utilities. You have to think about issues like groundwater recharge and you know, yeah. water reuse. And you know, Intel's a really good example of what they do in Chandler. Yeah, And they example. continue to grow because they have a fully integrated water strategy with the municipality. Yeah. And the re regulations promote that. But it, it, you know, it, it, this said company, in Germany is also interesting because, you know, yeah, there's more water there than where you are, Nate, but water's a local issue. People yep. care about how you're using their water. It's not yep. your water. And the fact that there's more water doesn't really mean that there's more water available in a way. I mean, they've got declining yep. groundwater levels and it just speaks to, yeah, it's a technology solution, but if you don't engage with the municipality, the commute, civil society, then you're gonna lose your social license to operate yeah. in the scheme of things. So yeah. I, really, really interesting and, and complex um, yeah. you know, from a, a, a business growth perspective, which is what you were referring yeah. to. 
Yeah, and I think that's where, I mean, obviously I'm biased here, right? But like no, in, innovation, no, innovation has a really serious role to play in this, right? Because, you know, Germany and Nevada don't want to miss out on the opportunity to create an entirely new economic ecosystem within their community. That's an incredible opportunity long-term, right? And so how, what do you do then, right? It doesn't have to be either or, you know, right. like, um, like here in Reno, you know, we've deployed water recycling. It, water recycling has had an extraordinary run here um, in the entire community, um, you know, rallying around how to update our water infrastructure in order to extend the resource so we can have this long-term opportunity. We're getting ready to build an effluent pipeline, right? Wow. Um, I mean, that's really thinking outside the box because of the value of what we think this opportunity is for our community to employ people and create a whole new industry here, right? Hey, hey, you know, Nate, you're, I mean, you're, you're talking about technology innovation, but you're also touching on what, what I believe is a real opportunity in terms of innovative partnerships. So the ability yep. for a manufacturing company to partner with the community and the utility um, and engage in a discussion on economic development. You know, this is yep. a business growth economic development issue. So how do you think about it very broadly beyond just a tech solution? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's, a, it, it's a bigger issue than just one technology or another, right? It, yeah. It, Tom, aren't you glad you brought this up? <laughs> I just dropped in the, I didn't even drop I, I, in the I, name I, of the company. It's just a I, certain I, electric I, vehicle I, leader. I, right. And, um, I, you know, it's a hypothetical, right? Hypoth exactly. <laughs> yeah. but, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned the, the effluent pipeline, Nate. And I think mm -hmm. in terms of water reuse, that's really interesting part of this whole nexus puzzle which is essentially what we've all been talking about here water and energy and the role of industry and utilities right and um I had a really interesting conversation with el paso water and mm. they're looking at a direct to just dis direct to distribution model very similarly in terms yeah. of direct reuse and he phrased it wonderfully um the cto he said that uh, water reuse should be done out of diversification not desperation I yep. think that is exactly the strategy to, to think ahead for the future for when you're going to need this additional source of water, yep. not when, when the proverbial shit hits the fan and it's too late and suddenly you have to build very quickly. So I think to me that diversification not, um, rather than desperation really sums up how, how reuse can be part of that, that equation. Yeah, look, and I think there's some real lessons to be learned. Like we have, we have members that were involved in developing a desalination plant 10 years ago in Brisbane, okay. 15 years ago in Brisbane, something like that. And, um, you know, they were approaching a situation kind of like what Cape Town saw, you know, just a couple of years ago with where it was like countdown to running out of water from the reservoirs. Day zero. And yeah. it was like, I don't, I, it was like a month or something before commissioning that plant and it started to rain. And it rained <laughs> and flooded as bad, a little worse, right? In some regards to what's going on down there now, a decade later, right? And they, they turned around and they were like, look, the cost of the desal water, you know, now that the reservoirs are full is so extraordinary that, you know, they, they decided to not turn the desalination plant on, right? And then after a few years, brought on, you know, 30% of it, right? And started to use that as a way to diversify their supply and a way for their rate payers to be able to adjust to higher costs. Um, anyway, and, and are building up now to where that is a permanent part of their kind of like baseload supply right. that everyone is, is understanding, you know, will be part yeah. of the mix right so i you're exactly right I, I think 
that's a great example of how complicated these issues are. Yeah. <clears throat> Beyond the. Uh... Oh, we. Nate, uh... I, I, <laughs> Nate, Nate I, I get all choked up when I talk to you. <laughs> I, I really do, yeah, right. especially, especially when you're in the booth. But, um, <laughs> I, you know, the, the complexity of water issues and public perception beyond the meme of day zero. Well, yeah, it, it, it's really not day zero. It's, you know, it's poor planning. It's, you know, impacts climate change and so on. And then, you know, what are the infrastructure uh, investments yeah. that you build? And, and we talked about this initially, you, you mentioned the word resiliency. So yeah, how does, how does Cape Town become more sustainable and resilient in the face of, you know, current and projected uh, conditions that don't reflect the past at all? Yeah, totally. And then like, you know, learning from past experience, right? I mean, what Brisbane is going through now in, in many ways is quite different from the flooding from 12 years ago um, right. because, because they changed the system in order to try and fix the problems they had last time. And, you know, there's some new problems now and, and they're learning from one of the things that I think is really cool is one of the, one of the big struggles they had last time was how long it took for them to kind of assess damage and then figure mm. out how to compensate people who were impacted, right? Um, we're, we actually got called by one of our members um, this last week and are moving really quickly to help them deploy uh, a new technology that will help them improve that process so that they can get through the whole process of assessing damage reporting to the insurance authorities, right? And having people be able to be compensated for their damages much, much quicker. And, you know, that's like, for me, again, that's like, goes to that kind of more safer, cheaper, right? It's like, right. you know, serving the public um, more effectively so that there's less of a financial impact on, on the whole community, right? So they can recover faster. That's, like that's resiliency right there, right? It's pretty cool. Yeah, it, exactly. It's a different way to look at innovation as well, isn't it? In terms of the part of, it's not necessarily the hardware or the software or improving an existing right. asset. It's actually the auditing part to help. Because I think, Will, you described Nate's organization as streamlining procurement, but this is another, <laughs> but this is beyond I, like, okay, I, we, have a, <laughs> we have a solution to make your water treatment plant more efficient. This is a different part of that. Still right. innovation in water, but it's not. So that, that's kind of an interesting um, connection yeah. that you've made as well. You know, Tom, bringing up procurement, I mean. Like, <laughs> We're not going to no use the word it. in the title, though. We've right. No one promise, likes to right? talk. I know. Right. You know, we, we it, talked for a while about should we brand ourselves as a procurement accelerator? Right. Um, but it's like, God, no, don't don't talk about that. Right. But but the bottom line is that. You know, our our many of our members are so big and public and for all the right reasons have very strict rules to make sure that, you know, there's no funny business or fraud going on in who they do contracts with. But sometimes that, that does hold them back from being able to be responsive, right? Sure. And take risks to try new things. And that's where our model, where we have funding, like in the bank, ready to deploy new things based on our members' needs, and the criteria that comes with the funding, but you know this this response in Brisbane right now is a perfect example of we are able to support them to just get the kit and start <sighs> assessing damage, and and then they can circle back through the formal procurement process after the fact and figure out how to do it long term. But right now we're able to say just get started. We can figure out the terms, you know six weeks from it, now right I, I, that that is such a powerful value proposition i mean in the scheme it's, of things 
for me, Will, it's really exciting with all the projects we've ever done. We've never done like emergency response before. Right. Right. So this is kind of a new application where somebody's like, hey, we have this like thing going I, on right now that we need a solution for. Um, we um, it's we'll, really we always cool. talk about the urgency with which yeah. we kind of I think everyone's a bit tired of talking hypothetically about <laughs> future problems and 2050 goals was we've got serious challenges now we need to deploy solutions now and make make absolutely so we talk about the the kind of bias fraction of, of who we choose to come on with the stream and i think that is a great example you described that nate of having the funds the ability to get the right solution there urgently and then the, the official procurement that naturally comes with public sector will, will follow yeah. you're not you're not bypassing that but Correct. you're kind of not circumnavigating but you're allowing that to happen as it's needed as opposed to so yeah. so what we do is we do all the procurement legwork ahead of time right right so when it's when there's a need we can just move forward right so we we do all the procurement work ahead of time we raise all the funds ahead of time so that when there's a need and a decision we can just start Deploy right immediately absolutely yeah. Well, uh, speaking of um, urgency and a bias fraction, uh, Nate, we know those um, those donuts. Uh, we don't want them to get cold at this uh, right. this, this educational meet. So that's um, right. I have to I have to build some resiliency in my family, right? <laughs> um, and and go take the kids to school and meet their teachers and say hello to everybody, right? Hundred percent, right? Which is why building. why we're all here, right? So <laughs> totally. Um, totally. Nate, listen, it's been a pleasure to to have you on. Thanks for. Uh, bringing the perspective from Nevada, seeing some of the proactive measures that have taken place where, you know, there is a serious need for, uh, for water right now. And good to hear about some of your, your latest developments within Water Start. So great to have you on. Uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, Will, final comments from yourself? Uh, yeah, uh, Nate, always enjoy the conversations. Me too. Uh, keep, yeah. keep being provocative. Uh, I think you've got a really unique way of looking at some of the issues. It's not the normal narrative. It is, you know, re for better no, or worse. Take, well, I, I'll let you know when it's worse, but, yeah, um, okay, great. <laughs> but, but no, th this is a richer conversation about issues that, you know, are in fact complicated. So, they Keep aren't. doing what you're doing and get out of that booth. Really, you need to, <laughs> uh, you know, it's not good. I can't for you. wait. I can't wait. You, yeah. You, you don't look good with a gray background. It's, you know, no, <laughs> no it, you, you look terrific. It, it so, matches so your ne beard. Next time, next time we got to do one of these um, when it's a little warmer and I can, I can do it from my outdoor office. Right. So <laughs> sounds good. All Great. right. Nate, take care. Thanks, Enjoy the donuts and family. Thanks, Bye. Tom. Thanks, Will. All the best. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Well.